Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, and we thank you all for attending the PD Literary Festival. Uh, it's been a wonderful festival where we've had uh, lots of opportunities to learn a great deal uh, and also be uh, entertained by our writers as well because they all are, are very fascinating and outgoing personalities. Um, and we hope that next year when this festival rolls around again, the third annual PD Literary Festival, that you will uh, sometime in October maybe keep an eye out for the brochures and the flyers so that you can uh, return to us. Um, our last event of the festival is certainly not the least, uh, as Ms. Sharon McCrum is here to read from her work uh, and talk about her work. Um, when I was a graduate student at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville back in the mid-90s, a good friend of mine passed on a story he copied from a literary magazine. And he said to me, read the first line of this and you'll be a Sharon McCrum fan forever. And a few days later, I sat down to read the story. The story was entitled Southern Comfort. And the first line goes like this. Love, Vicki used to say, is like flushing yourself down the toilet. A nice cool ride and a lot of crap at the end. <laughs> I've been hooked on Sharon McCrum's fiction ever since. Southern Comfort is now included in Ms. McCrum's 1997 collection of short stories, Foggy Mountain Breakdown, and the back cover of that collection quotes a starred review of Ms. McCrum's work from Booklist. McCrum's stories, the reviewer writes, will pluck at the heart like a twangy country love tune. They'll make readers wonder, laugh, weep, and mourn. They'll evoke anger, sorrow, fear, and tenderness. They'll entertain, repel, delight, and mesmerize. Her subjects range from forensic anthropology to the NASCAR circuit, and in the background of all of her work is her devotion to the South, particularly to the beauty and mystery of Appalachia. She has earned too many awards and honors for me to name here. A short list includes the Sherwood Anderson Short Story Award, the Flora McDonald Award, the Wilma Dykeman Award for Regional Historical Literature from the East Tennessee Historical Society, and two Best Appalachian Novel Awards from the Appalachian Writers Association, a group that also honored her in 1997 for outstanding contribution to Appalachian literature. But her own words best describe to you the complex beauty of her work. She states, my books are like Appalachian quilts. I take brightly colored scraps of legends, ballads, fragments of rural life, and local tragedy, and I piece them together into a complex whole that tells not only a story, but also a deeper truth about the culture of the Mountain South. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Sharon McCrum. In 2002, I had written, at that point, about 15 novels, and my publishers in New York thought they understood me pretty well. And they said, well, you've written a, a book called The Rosewood Casket about Daniel Boone and about losing the land. You wrote about the first woman hanged for murder in North Carolina. You wrote about the Civil War and Ghost Riders. You wrote about water pollution and The Hangman's Beautiful Daughter. What are you going to do next? And I said, I would like to rewrite the Canterbury Tales and set it in NASCAR. And they said, no, no, really. We need to know what you're going to do for your next book. But that is what I was going to do, because I was very interested in the whole idea of the pilgrimage. And I had studied the Canterbury Tales when I was in graduate school at Virginia Tech. They feared me at Virginia Tech, because I was a little older than most of the graduate students. And the word went around that I was making A's because I knew Dickens. And so um, when we had to do term papers on Hamlet, I, I wrote a term paper comparing Hamlet's mother, Queen Gertrude, to Jackie Onassis. And that's when the word went around, do not let her near great literature or she will break it. But I accidentally slipped into the medieval studies class and we studied Chaucer. 
And if you remember the Canterbury Tales, is the story of a group of pilgrims that are making the 90 mile journey from London to Canterbury to pay their respects at the shrine of Thomas Becket, who was martyred in the cathedral at Canterbury in 1176. Now, the reason people go on pilgrimages is because they need something. You go talk to a saint in hopes that he will be on your side and, and go have a word with God about your money troubles or your health problems or your love life or whatever it is that needs to be fixed. And the reason these people in the Canterbury Tales were going to talk to Beckett was because he was from London, their hometown. And I think they figured that even if St. Paul couldn't get his head around their problems, Thomas Beckett was their neighbor and he had just left. So he was the saint most likely to understand your problems if you were a Londoner in the 13th century. So I thought that is such a wonderful universal story. All you would have to do to modernize it is to change the saint. And I thought in the southeastern United States, who would the saint be? And at the time I was in graduate school, the answer would have been Elvis. Think about all those people going to Graceland even 30 years later and leaving flowers on the grave. But although I understood the Elvis phenomenon intellectually I never got it emotionally and it takes about two years of research to do a book and I was not spending two years with Elvis so I waited I needed a saint and in 1997 Princess Diana died remember and the whole world went crazy for about 10 days and women in this country got up at four o'clock in the morning to watch the funeral and their husbands were saying you idiot you didn't even know her why are you watching this funeral at four o'clock in the morning? And all the women are going, it's so sad. And I was really tempted to do Diana. But in order to do that, I would have to set the book in Britain because she's buried in County Durham. And so you really can only do a story like the Canterbury Tales in which you're doing rich, old, young, poor, all walks of life, absolutely every single type of person in society that broad a spectrum you can't do in any culture except your own and I know a lot about British culture but I don't know every geographic part of it I don't know what a white trash name is in Yorkshire but boy I know in Florence so <laughs> so I couldn't use Diana so I waited for a saint and in 2001, in the last 11 seconds of a race that lasted three hours, Dale Earnhardt, seven-time champion of NASCAR, went into the wall in the last lap of the Daytona 500 and was killed, and the world changed. I live up in Virginia, about 100 miles from the track at Martinsville and the track at Bristol. I'm right in the middle. This was a February night. He had died in Florida. But when it came on the radio up where I live, people were pulling off the interstates of 220 and 81 and going to those dark, empty speedways where there wouldn't be a race for two or three months, just an empty, deserted parking lot. People were pulling into those parking lots and just standing together as if some national tragedy had happened. Truck drivers were leaving $100 NASCAR jackets on the fence and walking away. All those guys who laughed at their wives for getting up at four in the morning for Diana's funeral, got it. They're the ones who called into work the next day and said, I'm not coming in because there's been a death in the family, and they meant it. And I looked at this and I thought, well, I got me a saint. There's the saint that the southeastern United States could bond with. There was just one problem with writing the book, and that was that I knew absolutely nothing about NASCAR nothing. I thought Kurt Busch was the governor of Florida. So I had to, now the one thing you have to do if you're going to write a book is do a lot of research. And the more male oriented the subject is, the more research you have to do. Because there are a lot of gentlemen over 50 whose idea of a good time is to read the little lady's book and tell her what she got wrong. So if you're dealing especially with sports or firearms, you absolutely have to get everything right or else you'll get letters. And I used to not know what to do about that because of course I consult experts and one time I was 
dealing with a Civil War book, and I said that the Michigan Cavalry carried infield rifles, and I had asked an expert, because I didn't know, got letters from this crusty old lawyer in Texas who said, they didn't carry infields, they carried Spencer carbines, and he's got all this documentation. And I used to write back and say, look, I talked to an expert, and he says this, and you say that, so why don't y'all fight it out between you and leave me out of it? But that never made the guys happy. So I was trying to figure out what to do. And this time, I checked with a third expert who said, yes, they were indeed using Spencer carbines. So I wrote back to the crusty old lawyer in Texas, and I said, OK, I checked with a third expert, and you were right. So you're my new gun guy. And the next time I have a question about guns, I'm writing you. And he was thrilled. That's what he wanted, validation. He was the expert. So sure enough, a couple of months later, I was looking into the Battle of Kings Mountain over here west of Asheville, the turning point of the American Revolution. And the British commander at that battle, C Colonel Patrick Ferguson, is known for having invented the Ferguson rifle. It's a breech-loading rifle, and what it is is a modification, they said, of an earlier weapon called the Chauvet. So while I'm doing my research, I thought, well, I need to know the difference between a Chauvet and a Ferguson. What did he do? What, how did he change it? I wanted one sentence. So I write to the guy in Texas, and I said, OK, what's the difference between a Ferguson and a Chauvet? About three days later, I got a package. And he had Xeroxed all this information out of gun manuals. Thought, OK, 40 pages. The next week, I got another package. And this time, it was diagrams of the internal workings of both weapons. And then he called me up the next week and said, OK, I phoned the British Army. <laughs> and I asked them for their technical specifications for the gun. And they said, that was 1780, sir. We don't use that gun anymore. And he said, look around. We, you probably still have the plan somewhere in the filing cabinet. So I now have a gun expert. And the research is really the fun part. So a little bit later, when I got off into doing NASCAR, remember, all this, guy's know, all this guy knows is how to practice law in Texas and everything in the world about guns. And he doesn't know anything else. Well. When I got into doing NASCAR, um, one of the people that I got to know was the guy who won the Daytona 500 in 2002, and that's Ward Burton, a Virginia driver. And they invited me to introduce him at a banquet, and it was going to be a sportsman's banquet. All the people out in the audience, mostly male, hunters, conservationists, gun guys, and here I was going to introduce this macho NASCAR driver to all these gun guys and sportsmen. And I was terrified because I didn't know what to say. They just wanted a little introduction. And I thought, well, I, I should be sort of literary. So I Googled him to find out what I could say. And it said, well, he won the Daytona 500. He's a race car driver. But then it said, in 1871, the Springfield Arms Company in Massachusetts developed a rifle to be offered for sale to the US Army. And the two men who invented this gun were William Ward and Bethel Burton. And therefore, the gun was called the Ward Burton. And I said, that's perfect. Here's this tough, macho, hunting NASCAR driver, and there happens to be a gun with the same name. I will compare them. That will make a wonderful speech with metaphors and stuff. So, but I know nothing about guns. So I called the crusty old lawyer in Texas who knows nothing about NASCAR, and I said, what can you tell me about the Ward Burton? And he said, I sure would like to fool around with one on a firing range. And I said, yeah, me too, but we need to talk about guns. And uh, he said, well, Ward Burton rifle was a lousy gun. They offered it for sale to the Army, but the Army didn't buy it. They went with the Chauvet. Um, and I said, I can't say that. And he said, you know, it, it jams when it rains, and it's hard to clean, and it was too expensive for the ordinary troops. I said, look, tell me something nice. Was it ever used in a battle? He said, oh, yes. Company K of the 7th Cavalry carried that gun at the Little Bighorn. 
I said, that's not helpful. <laughs> he said, the barrel's too short. I said, I know I can't say that. So I said, look, this gun has the same name as a NASCAR driver. I have to introduce the guy in a speech. I have to say something nice. Tell me something nice I can say about the Ward Burton rifle. And there was a long pause. And then my t Texas gun guy said, darling, tell your race car driver that if he had been my boy, I would have named him Smith and Wesson. <laughs> so that's what I said. But I was a long way from knowing anything about NASCAR when I started. So, so I had to get experts. And one of the nice things about having made the New York Times bestseller list is that people will let you in anywhere when you're doing research. So I have sat in Tennessee's electric chair. I've hung out with guys on death row. I've gone on patrol with cops. I've done just about anything I wanted to do because I was working on a book. So when I wanted to do NASCAR, I got to do laps on Lowe's Motor Speedway at 200 miles an hour. And I got to go to the races at Martinsville and Atlanta and Charlotte and Martinsville in the skybox. Not out in the bleachers, you know, where everybody's there with the earplugs on. No, the skybox is where they have a chef and an open bar and a fireplace. And the guy behind me was Leonard Nimoy from Star Trek. <laughs> You know, and Pamela Anderson and Kid Rock dropped by. It's a whole different world up in the skybox. But anyway, um, so I got to see races, and I learned about the races. And that sport made sense to me when other sports didn't. And I think part of it has to do with something Richard Petty said. He said once, when a football player makes a mistake, they penalize him five yards. When I make a mistake, they take me away in an ambulance. And that's, there's an urgency about it. A lot of our safety innovations in, in the highway seat belts and the protective um, steel around the chassis in a car, we learned all those things one death at a time from stock car racing. And so I, I got a great respect for those guys and for the sport, and it is a sport. In football, after every play, you know, they take a little break and they have the huddle and all that stuff, but in NASCAR, you go three and a half hours and the longest you stop is 13 seconds and you don't get out of the car. The temperature in the car is 120 degrees, so those guys lose 11 pounds in every race. The G-forces are so strong that if, you, if you're not strong enough to turn the wheel, you're going to go in the wall. If you are strong enough, you're bruised when you finish the race and you feel like you've been in a clothes dryer. Your hands sweat in the leather gloves so that Ward, my buddy, has at the end of a race a solid line of blisters from the bottom of his little finger to his wrist. It's blistered from the sweat rubbing against the leather. And four days later, he's got to get back in the car. And I don't think a blister heals in four days. And he's doing that 36 times a year. So yeah, it's a sport. And so I had to learn all this. And I wrote St. Dale and had a wonderful time doing it. The hardest part about it was dealing with all the literary types, because I would go off to, to talk to people at writers' conferences in places like California, and all these little size two ladies from New York in the black outfits would go, NASCAR, isn't that just driving around in circles for three hours? And finally I said, yeah, yeah it is. And writing's not very hard either. It's just those same 26 letters over and over in various combinations. What's so hard about that? The interesting thing about it, though, was that this with the ballad novels, the books that I have that are set in the Appalachian Mountains, everywhere I go, people come up to me and say, your book changed me. I was living in Ohio or Michigan or, you know, somewhere out west and, or Florida and read this book and was thinking about moving. And when I read She Walks These Hills and learned about Western North Carolina, I called a realtor and moved there. And I'll go, I hope you like it. And they go, yeah, that's where I'm supposed to be. And so, so many people read the stories that I had about the mountains of North Carolina and South Carolina, Tennessee, Southwest Virginia, Kentucky, 
and felt like that was where they belonged. But those books didn't change me because my family settled those mountains in 1790, so I already knew what to expect. The book that changed me was St. Dale, the one that I did about NASCAR. Because sometimes people become writers because they don't work and play well with others. Um, I'm really terrible at interacting socially. If there's a room with 50 people in it and a cat, I'll go sit with the cat. And when my class sold magazine subscriptions to finance the junior prom in high school, I didn't even sell a subscription to my parents. So I really didn't know very well how to interact with people. And I got away with that in all the ballad books because when you're dealing with the Civil War or Daniel Boone or an 1830s legal case, you just go look it up in the books. And I'd been doing that all my life. But you can't do that with NASCAR. There aren't any books. However, most of the people in NASCAR who made history are still around, like Cale Yarborough, who is right here. So I had to learn to talk to people. And I guess I found out that I had really changed. First of all, I got hooked on the sport so that if I was trapped somewhere and couldn't watch the race, I would call a friend on, the, on my cell phone and say, talk me through this race. Well, in 2004, I had finished this book, and nobody knew I was interested in NASCAR. The thing about talking to an author is, by the time the book is published and you want to discuss the book with them, you're at least a year too late. Because it takes a year after you finish a book for it to go through the pipeline in publishing and come out as a finished book. So when it's a brand new finished book in your hands, it's last year in my head. I'm way on to something else. So nobody knew that I had developed an interest in NASCAR because the book wouldn't be out for a year. And Young Harris College in North Georgia invited me to come and give their literary lecture on one of the ballad novels. So I said I would come and agreed to go in April that year, 2004. And before I left, my office got a call from the high school nearby who said all of our students are reading one of your books and we know you're going to be at Young Harris College just 10 miles away would you come to the high school and talk to our kids and they said you're going to be at the college on Friday if you'll stay over the weekend you can come to us on Monday morning and we don't have hotels in this little mountain county in Georgia but we have tourist cabins which were built modern, especially for all those people coming through looking at the leaves. And they have little kitchenettes and TVs and bedrooms, and um, they're off by themselves in the woods. So I agreed that I would go, and on Friday I gave my talk on Appalachian literature at Young Harris. Saturday I went mountain climbing with a writer friend of mine down there. And Sunday I was by myself in the little cabin ready to watch the NASCAR race, which was Darlington. And I turned it on, and that's when I discovered the satellite dish was not adjusted, and I had no sound and no picture, and I could not fix it. So I whipped out my cell phone to get talked through the race and discovered, thanks to the Georgia mountains, that I had no signal. So there I was, out of, out of the communication stream for the entire rest of the day. At 9 o'clock the next morning, I walked into that little county high school to give my talk to the students, and there in the classroom, and right in the middle, were 26 bright and eager students with their notebooks open and their pens poised, ready to talk about literature. And off in the corner were the five guys you hope you never see in a class. The ones in the chains and the work boots and the hats pulled down and the expressions. And they don't want to be in class on Monday morning. And they don't want to hear some lady author talk about made up books. And those are the guys that usually you, you hope will go to sleep so that you can talk to the people that actually want to learn. And that probably would have been me up until that day. And I walked into the room, looked at the 26 students with their notebooks open, and I said, now before we talk about Appalachian literature, who won at Darlington? And the 26 students went, what? And the five outlaws in the corner looked at each other. And finally, the biggest, toughest one kind of raised his hand. He had never gotten a question right in English class before, <laughs> but this looked like his day. <laughs> so very carefully, he said, 
48. And I said, Jimmy Johnson? What happened to Matt Kenza? He said, oh, they penalized the 17 for passenger and uh, caution. I said, did he go to the red truck? Yes, ma'am. I said, it didn't do him any good, did it? No, ma'am. I said, what happened to the nine car? Oh, ma'am, Bill Elliott doesn't drive that nine car anymore. It's that Ricky Casey Kane. I said, he wrecked at Darlington, didn't he? Spun out, finished 13th. I said, Bill Elliott would not have wrecked at Darlington. No, ma'am. So for about five minutes, the outlaws and I discussed the NASCAR race. And I got everything squared away about what happened. And then I went ahead and gave my talk on Appalachian literature to 26 bright and eager students and five disciples. Those guys were my new best friends. And they sat with me at lunch and they said, wow, you wrote a book about NASCAR? We're going to read it. And later their teacher said, no, none of them has ever read a book. And I said, yeah, but I bet they read this one. And sure enough, when the book came out a year later, I got a copy signed by me and by Ward Burton, the Daytona 500 winner, and we sent it to Georgia, to them, and they did read it. And they stayed in school, because if you can read one book, you can read any book. And they graduated this past May, and they're going to college, and they invited me down to graduation, and I went. So I think all an author really wants is to change the world in some way, and I think of all the books I've written, St. Dale may have changed the world more than any other. They're teaching it now in Chaucer classes. Guys in high school get it. What's more fun is when the junior league who understands Chaucer perfectly suddenly develops an interest in NASCAR. That's fun. When little old ladies come up and go, yes, Matt Kenseth. Okay. So anyhow, I'm, I'm sort of trying to balance this and be the, the bard of NASCAR, I suppose. Well, in 2004, a magazine called Appalachian Heritage, which is put out by Berea College, said that they have a tradition of dedicating one issue per year to a Southern writer. And they wanted to do me that fall. And they said, all we need from you, we're going to have an interview, we're going to have people write about you and all this stuff. All we need from you directly is a short story to publish in our literary magazine. And I said, fine. I will write you a story about NASCAR. And they said, no, you won't. We are an Appalachian literary magazine, honey. You can do quilts, churns, mules, your daddy's plow, wood carving. You can't do no NASCAR. And I said, you know, I bet I can write you a story with NASCAR in it that will work in Appalachian culture. And they said, well, you can send it. So I wrote it, and what it's really about is the new people moving into the mountains and that friction between the rich new people coming into the mountains and the people who have been there all along. And so I sent it to them, and they said, we read it, and we cried, and we're going to publish it. And it is about NASCAR in a way. So I'm going to read it to you. It's called Abide With Me, after that old hymn. And the narrator is the widow of a race car driver. A plaque, a photo, a cardboard likeness. Well, they will find none of those things here. Oh, they exist, and I have them still. But they are packed away in the other house, buried with the life I have now escaped, as surely as Liam has escaped his. I cannot honestly say that Liam loved our mountain house, Perhaps he did for all I know, but he was never here very much. I was trying to please him when I chose it, but he may have let me buy it as much for the tax advantage as to spend time in this place. But you grew up in these hills, I said, as he looked down from our limestone terrace at the newly landscaped ridges studded with what he called stone and glass excrescences built by the summer people. He shuddered a little. I'm not from here, he said, not from this place. Well, naturally it has changed since he was a raw-boned mountain boy here, but at least it is close to heaven. One cannot argue with that. Back when he was not Liam, long before I knew him, when he was plain old Billy, a North Georgia dirt track driver, 
before the fame and the money bronzed his life until the only mountains around him were the barriers of handlers and managers and buffers between him and everything else, he did come from these mountains. When I chose this stone and glass eyrie on a cliff top, I thought I had found the best of both worlds for us, an elegant home in an exclusive enclave with other people of our social stratum. And all around us, the enfolding hills he always said he missed so much. I don't know what else he could have wanted. Sometimes I would stand outside under a blanket of stars and wonder if he might be up there, looking down on me in some form of heroic transfiguration. There must be scores of people out there who would believe that, but I was not one of them. Or else I fancied he might be there beside me, if only I could have turned around quickly enough. If there is a hereafter, he ought to spend it watching over me instead of staying out there with them. Surely now that he's dead, it can be my turn at last. The local people come by sometimes to deliver flowers on his birthday, never on mine, or on the anniversary of some race he had won. Sometimes they bring me letters from strangers that were put in their mailboxes by mistake. As I stand on the threshold, I can see them peering past me down the hall into the glass-walled great room, looking for the contrails of Liam's fame, a model of a race car, a bronze plaque, a photo of him with the president or a film star, a life-size cardboard effigy of Liam himself, arms folded, staring bleakly into the camera with that look I never could quite decipher. Now, though, I think I have worked out the meaning of that somber expression, so different from those first posed publicity pictures they took of him when he was just beginning the journey that brought me here and him nowhere. Back then, and 10 years hardly seems like a long time looking back, Liam in a royal blue fire suit mugs at the camera with an aw shucks grin, still marveling at his good fortune and happy to bask in the light of his newfound celebrity. He is a chosen one, ready to pay any price for that ride. A decade later, the face in the frame is a solemn man in black and gold with mournful eyes and a chiseled face infinitely more handsome through time and experience, but minus the joy he took with him when he started. I see nothing of that jubilant boy in the face of his somber successor. Now he is like a one-star general who has seen the war, not from a desk in the Pentagon, but from a blood-soaked battlefield. The youthful smile is gone, supplanted by the weary resignation of one who knows he has to live with his wishes granted. It isn't fun anymore. He knows it. The rest of them don't. You can die out there. He knows that too. He has a scar for every time that lesson was repeated. The younger ones drive dirt track on weeknights under playful assumed names, too impatient for the clatter of their own heartbeats to wait for the real race on Sunday. But through the week, Liam goes to practices and crew meetings and banquets and conferences. He signs his name a few hundred more times, always with a weather eye on the inexorable approach of Sunday. At daybreak, in the hours before the race, I pretend to be asleep as I listen to him throwing up in the bathroom. Later, when he steps out of the motorhome into a field of microphones and camera lights, he makes bland remarks in a toneless voice and they will take his numbness for courage. But he knew, he knew. The people who come to Pry probably know about that last trophy too, the one he did not win. The victor that day, that West Coast boy with the bland, perfect face of a plastic doll, won the race that Liam never finished, and afterward he brought the brass monstrosity to me as an offering, kindly meant, or perhaps a sacrifice, to some nemesis that he should not be the next one. There's always a next one. I accepted the trophy because to do so was easier than explaining why the thing meant nothing to me. It meant a great deal to the winner. That was the point. I came here to the mountain house a few weeks after it happened, after the carefully choreographed public memorial services, after decorous press releases and days of business meetings that melded into one long ordeal of signing pieces of paper. 
I work in the garden now, in the cool of the evening. It gives me something to do with my hands while I think, turning over in my mind all the things I never actually said. Why don't you quit then? Surely we have enough money for that. Why don't you just walk away while you can? Unspoken. Useless, really, because he couldn't walk away. Back to being nobody, or maybe he just loved it. Even when his hands shook so much he could barely put on his driving gloves, he would not have turned back. The closest I ever heard him come to expressing regret came once when I walked him to the car at Darlington, and he murmured, I just wish it could be fun again. The funeral service was lovely. The governor said a few words. The president sent a telegram. Inside the church were the same sleek people one might expect to find at a film premiere or aboard someone's yacht off St. Thomas. Outside on the church lawn, standing vigil in the rain, were the others, the truck drivers, the store clerks, and all those pitiful women who loved whatever image of Liam they had conjured from that face on the keychain, the coffee mug. And somewhere, caught between the celebrities and the people in the rain, was Liam. The first time I saw the boy, it was nearly dusk. I knew that he didn't belong to one of the families up here. He looked all right. They all wear jeans and t-shirts nowadays, but there was an exotic look about his wiry frame, his black hair and dark almond eyes that made me think local. I judged him to be about 14. In another time, he would not have been out of place on this mountain in buckskin and moccasins. But now, in faded Levi's and battered sneakers, he simply looked like one of the cove dwellers scouting for odd jobs among the summer people. He squatted on his haunches beside the flower bed, watching me work with clinical interest. I turned to ask him what he had come about, and it was then that I noticed his T-shirt, Davy Allison, Rising Star. It was a crisp, unfaded black, a yellow star in the black and yellow-orange 28 car bright as new. Davy Allison, you should not be wearing that shirt out and about, I told him. It's probably quite valuable. He raised his eyebrows. Huh? Davy Allison, rising star. He died 10 years ago at Talladega. That shirt is a collector's item. It ought to be kept in a box, not worn. You know about racing? His tone of incredulity nettled me. I should, I said stabbing the creeper vine with my trowel. He watched me in silence for a few moments, and then without a word, he bent forward and began to pull more vine tendrils from the bed of impatience. If he had pressed sympathy on me, or asked about Liam, if he had said anything at all, I might have snubbed him and sent him on his way. But the companionable silence was oddly comforting, as if a friendly collie had amb ambled up to keep me company. I was married to Liam Bethel, I said, still intent upon the encroaching weeds. I suppose you knew that. He shrugged. I knew she lived somewhere up here. Well, you don't. He smiled. My people have been on this mountain for a long time, he said. I knew he was a local. NASCAR t-shirts are not worn up here on the hill. Summer people may watch the races on their big screen TVs, but they do not wear their hearts on their sleeves or on their shirts. Do you mind how things have changed up here, I asked him. He shrugged. I don't think these people want to be here. I was puzzled. Surely, if you spend a million dollars on a home. But he went on. In the gift shops, they play Navajo flute music. They decorate their homes in desert colors as if they thought North Georgia bordered New Mexico. It's not that they're here that I mind. It's that they want to make here somewhere else. But we don't really live here, I reminded him. We only come for a while to get away from real life. In those dark Indian eyes, I saw a flicker of Liam's bleak-eyed stare. They come up here, he said softly. They shouldn't change it and take it away from them that loved it like it was. After a few more evenings of weeding and comfortable silence, I learned the boy's name was Eddie. I didn't quite catch his surname, but it sounded German. Anyhow, it ended with mocker. I didn't like to ask again. 
Once I tried to give him a handful of dollar bills for his help in the garden, but he only smiled and waved it away. By then I was glad of his company and had only been looking for a way to cement the bargain. Liam would not have offered him money. He knew these people, but I can only guess at what motivates them to do anything. Perhaps Eddie's people were better off than I had supposed. I had an idea they might be silkscreen printers. These hills are full of jackleg craftsmen. Every day he wore a different racing shirt. Dale Earnhardt, Neil Bonnet, Tim Richmond, all looking like new. His family manufactures these reproductions of racing legends, I thought, and I wondered if I ought to have a word with them about trademark infringement. But I was too tired to care, really. What does it matter if they sell a few bootleg t-shirts of dead drivers out here in the back of beyond? One day, though, when he was decked out in Fireball Roberts, I felt an un unaccountable spurt of irritation. Don't you have a Liam Bethel shirt? I asked him. He shrugged. Wouldn't be right to wear it up here, you being here and all. I wouldn't mind, I said, although I didn't know that until I heard myself say it. Just don't wear some cheap reproduction. Come inside. We kept caps and t-shirts and race trinkets in a drawer up here to give away in case, say, the TV repairman turned out to be a fan of racing. From the guest room bureau, I dug out an old shirt commemorating Liam's first cup win at Bristol. Here, I said, have it. You were his neighbor. He thanked me solemnly and went away soon after. It was only then that I remembered the curious sense of honor these local people had. If you ever did them the slightest good turn, they would be forever your vassal, and they would go to any length to repay a kindness. I hoped if the boy felt compelled to return a favor, it would come in the form of tomatoes from the family garden, and nothing more valuable or troublesome than that. A day or two later, in the gray evening, when the deer venture out of the woods, Eddie returned, empty-handed, but still in my debt, it seemed. Come on, I want to show you something, he said, fairly dancing with excitement. Inwardly, I sighed. What had he to show me? A litter of pigs, a prize watermelon, a hundred newly bootlegged copies of Liam's victory shirt. But I went with him anyhow, because I had grown tired of pulling up creeping vines from my flower bed. No matter how many times I ripped out the invaders' new shoots, more would have taken their place by the next time I weeded. In the gathering twilight, we walked away from the soaring glass houses on the manicured lawns, over to the other side of the mountain and into the woods, following no path that I could discern. But Eddie's pace never slowed. The sun was nearly gone, and in the night air, the chill deepened. Is it much farther, I asked, but he simply gestured forward and quickened his pace, so I stumbled on after him, knowing that without him I could not find my way back. Long minutes passed, punctuated only by the sound of twigs snapping as I hurried to keep up with this boy who neither stumbled nor slowed. I could see the stars again now, for the pines thinned as we reached the edge of the ridge. We stood on the edge of a precipice where an outcropping of rock formed a ledge overhanging the valley below. I was disoriented and did not know in which direction we had come. Should this be the side of the mountain that overlooked the village crossroads below? Or was it the wilderness side that gave out onto trees and a rock-studded stream? In any case, neither of those vistas spread out before me. I saw a forest stretching to the mountains across the valley, but far below us lay a circular field ablaze with lights. I could make out an oval of red Georgia mud encircled by a rickety grandstand of the sort one saw at high school baseball fields 40 years ago. Within the oval was an assortment of haulers, campers, pickup trucks, and here and there a garishly painted stock car, a dirt track. Well, they're common enough in North Georgia, but I had not known that one existed so close to our community. Surely some of the residents up here would have complained about it. Liam used to say that he attended the residence meetings to make sure they were not planning to hand out smallpox-infected blankets to the locals. Of course, they would do no such thing, but I did think they would object to having a dirt track in the proximity of their luxury homes. 
Eddie had knelt down on the edge, on the ledge at my elbow, and he was pointing excitedly at the spectacle below. Mud flew and cars slid forward. A race had begun. I watched the rainbow of cars circle the track for a moment, and the one that pulled ahead as it took the corner at full speed caught my eye. Red and silver, Liam's number. The paint scheme identical, even down to the sponsor's logos. Rage struggled with amazement. Was this what he had come to show me? This cheap imitation? This flagrant image theft? A greater sacrilege than a few knockoff t-shirts. You can't do this, I shouted into the silence, for the sounds of the track did not carry all the way to the mountaintop. I kept staring down at the track below while I screamed the words into the wind. Copyright infringement, lawyers, fraud. I won't allow it. I shook with fury, grieving widow now suddenly keeper of the flame, of the business anyway, ready to call lawyers to the solitary mountaintop as one might summon dragons. I would have said more, but all the while I had been watching those cars weaving and cornering around the track in a pavan on wheels. The way they took the corners at full speed but never got loose. The way they passed, a tap on the bumper here and there, but no one spun out. No one hit the wall. How many races had I seen over the years? 500? A thousand? Watching at first only to see if Liam would walk away but finally understanding the rhythms of the dance. At last able to judge the skill of the dancers themselves. I had seen them all, and without consciously trying to train my eye, I was able to tell good from great. I could discern style. I cannot explain it. A horse show judge will tell you that before a rider is halfway across a ring, he will know the novice from the expert, even at a walk. After a while, you just know, as I knew now. The pink 51, the red 25, the black and orange 28, the black number three. Oh yes, and there among them Liam's red and silver Chevy. All of them driving like no backwoods dirt driver ever could, in perfect control, with surgical precision at breathless speeds, reaction time a blink, a heartbeat. A hundred things to watch all at once, swoop and glide, cut and corner, but never, never slowing down in the river of air. It was really them. Neil Bonnet, Tim Richmond, Davy Allison, Dale Earnhardt, Liam Bethel. Impossible, but just slightly less impossible than the notion that anyone else could drive like that with such perfection, like angels and chariots out here in the middle of nowhere. I had found him. I gulped air to keep from crying out as I turned to ask Eddie where I was and how I could make my way down off this mountain to where they were, to Liam. But the boy was backing away from me, shaking his head, hurt by my outburst. I had rejected his gift. He held up his hands, imploring me not to follow. And he turned back toward the dark woods. I stumbled after him, crying out for him to stop, not to leave me alone on the mountain. But he was gone in an instant, and when I could no longer hear the sound of his footfalls in the bracken, I turned back to the ledge, thinking I would find my own way down into the valley. I would follow the lights. But they too were gone. I knelt down and crawled to the very edge of the precipice, leaning over as far as I dared, straining for a glimpse of what had been so clear before. All I saw from the rock outcrop was a dark and silent plain, black with an unbroken sea of trees, cold and silent under the distant stars. Abide with me. I have walked this mountain every day since then, at dawn, at twilight, even sometimes at midnight when the dew soaks my shoes and the night mist turns my hair to sodden strings, but Eddie, never came back, and though I have walked these woods a hundred times with that old hymn circling in my head, keeping time with my heartbeat, I have never found the rock ledge or that place in the valley where heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. A plaque, a photo, 
a cardboard likeness. I have all these things still. And a stone and glass house on a mountain close to heaven. I should probably explain, if you didn't know it, that Davy Allison, Neil Bonnet, Tim Richmond, Dale Earnhardt are all dead. So that was, that was the, his gift. The other thing that, that people would know if they were folklore students, she said his last name was ended in mocker. In Cherokee mythology, the trickster god, who is the coyote in, in Navajo mythology, is called the raven mocker. So she had met the raven mocker. He, wa he wasn't an ordinary little boy. He was, he was a Cherokee god. And when he said, my people have been on this mountain a long time, he meant the Nunahi, the Cherokee spirits. And she had befriended one, and he had given her a great gift, but she didn't recognize it. So that's, what, that's the, where the mythology intersects with NASCAR in the story and why it works. I think I may be the only person who ever tried not to write a sports story with NASCAR, but to use it the way, say, Tennyson used chivalry, knighthood, as a, as a metaphor for, for other things. I'm using these guys as the modern knights and doing my own Morta to Arthur sort of things. So I'm working on new things now and going back and doing a story, I think, about the mountains. But it's awfully hard to get leaded gas out of your system. <laughs> So every now and then I go back and, and do other things here and there. But that's probably, this story is the best, I think, intersection of the two things that I do. My concern about the issues of the mountains and, again, this other metaphor that I'm using. We have a term in the mountains, cosmic possum. Jane Hicks, the poet, came up with that term. What it means is somebody who is familiar with the old ways, usually they're second or third generation down from a couple who lived on a small farm way back in a rural area. Maybe their parents finished high school. But by the time you get down to this present generation, the cosmic possums, you're talking about college graduates, PhDs, people who have traveled all over the world, people who have laptops and are sophisticated. But because of their heritage, their parents and their grandparents, they still remember the old ways. They still know the quilt patterns and the fiddle tunes and the herbal remedies and the folk tales and all that. And I think that, that cosmic possum idea can be seen in every culture that's in transition. I was out um, in Arizona a couple of years ago with a folk singer friend of mine doing a program that we do. And in our free day, we decided to go up and look at the Grand Canyon. So we drove up there, and, and at dusk, we stopped at a little restaurant, actually a big restaurant with, um, that catered to tourists. And we went in, and they had arranged for some of the boys from the local reservation to come and do traditional native dances. So these were cute little guys, about nine years old, in these beaded Native American Navajo costumes with the feathers and the beads and the buckskin and all that doing these perfect dances that were over a thousand years old. And we watched it and after it was over and we finished dinner, we went out in the parking lot to get back in the car and saw one of the little dancers. And he was sitting on the running board of his dad's truck, still in the, pant, the buckskin pants of his dance uniform, playing his Game Boy. Now that's a cosmic possum. He knows a thousand year old Navajo dance and he plays Game Boy. And I'm sure he listens to Lincoln Park. So, you know, he's, he's at home in two cultures. And I guess my cosmic possum moment came last October, 2006, when I was nominated for the Library of Virginia Award for St. Dale. Now, a couple of weeks earlier, I had gone to the White House for the National Literary <laughs> Festival and gave a copy of the book to President and Mrs. Bush. It'll be interesting to see what they think of it. But, this was Richmond, and they were having this very elegant award ceremony. So I walk in, and everybody's in evening gowns and tuxedos, and I'm sitting at a table between the wife of William Styron and the current winner of the Pulitzer Prize, and we're talking about literature, and there's a string quartet playing, and they're serving all these wonderful things, and I won. 
and 12 hours later, the trophy and the evening gown were stashed in the back of the car, and I was 150 miles west of Richmond in the infield of the Martinsville Motor Speedway, wearing jeans and a J.E. Burton Construction Company t-shirt with a hot pass, and I was an assistant with, with a race car team for my driver. So I was the person who handed him the Gatorade and the person who caught him when he came out of the car. And that's a real cosmic possum moment. It's not one or the other. It's if you can go from making small talk with the winner of the Pulitzer Prize to hanging out with the Jack Man on a race team and be at home in either place, then you're a cosmic possum. And it's a wonderful way to be because I don't think you should ever forget any part of your heritage. You don't leave it behind, you just find a way to incorporate it in, into the new world and that makes you different from anybody else and probably cooler. Thank you.